शिवम सुंदर Here we are in the Deer Park. We just recited the Dhammachaka Sutta and the Anattalakkana Sutta. Next to us had a much louder speaker than us. So we had to stop and practice patience, Kanti Barami, Kanti Upa Barami. Actually it's appropriate because uh, Savaka Sangha, another meaning for Savaka Sangha is those who listen. So we had to listen first. When we listen attentively, as Anya Kondanya did, he became enlightened, didn't he? When you're listening to Lord Buddha teaching this sermon, the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, at the end of the teaching he had realized stream entry. So since it's the last talk actually. Just review a little bit where we are, where we've been. Last night on the Burning Ghat in Varanasi reminded me of Lord Buddha as the prince, as the Bodhisattva, just as he was leaving the palace. He was looking for a deathless aware that we were subject to death having been born. So looking at his wife and his child and aware of his, we're all in the same situation that having been born, we have to age and then we have to die. We have to be separated from the loved. And if we live to be old, then we have to deal with old age and sickness as well. So it was very powerful last night, wasn't it, to stand on the banks of the Ganges and I think there were very close to 20 corpses being burnt as we stood there and uh, average of 200 a day being burnt on those guts. It's been like that for at least 4,000 years. So it's, it's very uh, amazing, it's powerful to be able to stand on earth which actually has a large percentage of ash a large percentage of the ash of the previously burnt bodies. And as you walk around the different funeral pyres, you're actually walking on the ashes of this morning's corpses, yesterday's corpses, the day before's corpses. And so for me, and I'm sure for many of you, a sense of uh, sadness about samsara, Lord Buddha sometimes called the realm of death. So when we're born, we walk with death. That's characteristic of conditions, as Anya Kondanya realized while Lord Buddha was teaching, that which has the nature to arise has the nature to cease. So when you're born, your death is inevitable. It comes together. That's the nature of the characteristic. So we also saw the Brahmin priests doing their quite beautiful puja from the boat, looking at what's called arti. They were doing their prayers to the goddess of the Ganges River. So they do that prayer every morning, every afternoon. In the morning they're praying, they're asking the goddess of the river, please give us good luck, please give us good fortune, please give us good harvest, good health, etc. And then in the afternoon again, please give us good fortune, good health, save us from disaster. So this is very common spiritual practice for human beings is to pray and to make offerings and to look heavenward. But as we can see, even, even if God's bless you to some degree, or devas hear your prayers, standing on that very same bank just 300 meters down the river, nobody can avoid death. And so 
Lord Buddha would have been very familiar with the rituals of the Brahmin priests, coming from a high caste and, and uh, a wealthy family. They would have had their priests, their seers, their people who did rituals in the palace. And no doubt he saw the limitations. There's no end to praying because there's no end to dukkha. And prayers are only... Well, they're not very effective, are they, in terms of going beyond dukkha and realizing the deathless. So Lord Buddha left the palace, the Bodhisattva left the palace, searching for the deathless. And if you recall, he attained to the seventh jhana and then the eighth jhana, the most refined states of samadhi possible. And his remarkable mindfulness and incredible wisdom that he had already developed in previous lives, he was able to see that that wasn't the deathless, as amazing as it must be, infinite base of neither perception or non-perception, these incredibly subtle and uh, pure states of mind, but he was able to see that when the mind came out, out of that samadhi, that that state also degenerated. So even the most refined samadhi states, which are blissful beyond what words can describe, they're still subject to death. So he knew that wasn't the deathless. And then, or he realized that wasn't the deathless. Then he thought to go and strive with austerities, practicing patient endurance to its extreme in the cave that you also went to, Dungasiri Cave. And he was practicing there the extreme of patient endurance and not allowing his mind to enter jhana, even though it could very easily. He didn't allow it to. He just explored pain with patient endurance and he wondered if that was the way out of samsara, if that was the way to the deathless. And So for quite a long time he did that. We don't know exactly how long, but we know that when he said it's possible for someone to have suffered as much in their spiritual striving, but impossible that anybody ever suffered any more, then we know that the Bodhisattva's efforts were extraordinary. He also realized this isn't working eventually as heroic, as noble, as self-sacrificing, as courageous as it was, didn't work. And then he had the insight. And that was motivated by compassion as well. He's still trying to find the deathless so he can point the way to us, and to his back family and all of those that he later taught. So he had the insight or the memory that he attained to a jhana under the rose apple tree as a young boy and he remembered that that kind of samadhi or that kind of pleasure there was nothing unwholesome about it or unskillful about it and then he wondered could this be the middle way approach to combine some samadhi with focused contemplation and then he had that intuition this is it that'll work so then he wandered down from the mountain and you recall his skin went particularly gold after that insight about the middle way it's said that the there's two times in the final birth that the skin of the Bodhisattva will shine like gold and be especially radiant and then the Buddha the day before the Mahaparinibbana there's two occasions so Sujata's milkmaids saw him sitting under the goat's herd banyan tree and he was he looked like a deity he was radiant and gold even though he was so emaciated and thin they quickly went and told Sujata there's a there's a tree deva or a god sitting under the tree and Sujata quickly rushed and offered her milk rice dish which was uh, suitable nourishment for the Bodhisattva's realization later on that evening so under the Bodhi tree Lord Buddha had many insights or well, perhaps there are several ways to describe the same insight. But basically, he recollected his past lives. 50, 100, 1,000, 5,000, 50,000, it was a lot. With this laser-like samadhi that he had, that he could then focus in this reflective way. And he saw birth, aging, death, birth, aging, death, birth, aging, death, birth, aging, death. And he also saw karma. He saw that due to good things done, good deeds done, born in a happy destination, 
unskillful things, bad things done, born in an unhappy destination. And then he looked at other beings and he saw that it was the same. Seeing hundreds of thousands of other beings, born, aging, dying, born, aging, dying, born, aging, dying, according to karma, some going to heaven, some going to hell, some born as ghosts, some born as animals, and this huge recycling of conditions, these beings caught in this wheel, then he was investigating what's the cause of death. What's the cause of death? The cause of death is birth. Then asking that very, very important question, what's the cause of birth? What's the cause of birth? And the cause of birth was grasping deludedly for the three types of craving. Craving for pleasant experiences, craving for n not craving for pleasant, like the aversion aspect of craving, craving not for, the not wanting, and the craving for being is a clinging. And so he could see that this clinging and this craving was actually what was behind birth, and it was based upon tanha and upadana. Tanha is craving, upadana is grasping. So that's a very, very powerful energy, very, very powerful phenomena in the mind. You'll be able to see it later today because when we go and we look at the corpses, we stay there for some time and everybody feels very sober and people are on the bus and they're all quiet and people don't feel very hungry. That's when you can see these cravings and come down to a smaller level and the grasping's letting go a little. But you have a nice dinner and you have a nice sleep and you have a nice breakfast and then at shopping time, you'll see. You'll see this craving come up. <laughs> you can see that the habit to want things and to uh, and start thinking about the future, what you're going to do when you get back, and who you're going to call and upload your Facebook and all those things that you'll do. You'll see the becoming energy. What's next? You'll see these very powerful energies functioning in the mind, latent. So the Bodhisattva had the insight that that was the result of ignorance. The, the delusion and the craving can only function in the mind when the mind isn't aware of the truth. So ignorance is not knowing. And when you train yourself, as the Lord Buddha we're going to read shortly, explained in the Eightfold Path, you train yourself in right mindfulness, right concentration, right thinking, right contemplation, then you're applying the remedy to the ignorance and the delusion. You're cultivating karmic conditions, sankharas, that see the nature of sankhara. So it's the, the refined and utterly wholesome aspect of conditions that you have to use that helps the mind realize the unconditioned. So by applying mindfulness, or sometimes called truth discerning awareness, so when you apply this mindfulness, know the body is just a body, know that thoughts are just thoughts, know that feelings are just feelings, rather than building a self out of it and creating a self. When you can just apply that mindfulness and see its characteristics, this is applying uh, awareness of truth, which is the remedy to delusion and ignorance. And what happens when people do that, if their faculties are powerful enough, the mind sees it's not a self. It sees it very, very clearly, and it drops. It's a deluded attachment. So that's what happened when Lord Buddha taught Anya Kondanya, and then later when he went through the Anasalakana Sutta, went through the five khandhas, the body, the perceptions, the feelings, karmic formations, consciousness, the sense of consciousness. None of it's a self. He asks them, is it a self? If it was a self, you'd be able to con control it completely. Can you control it? Can you control a feeling? Can you only have pleasant feelings? Can you make a pleasant feeling last? Like, no. Then how can it be a self? Well, it's not a self. And Lord Buddha just asked them, he went through everything, everything that you can look at in that space where you're sitting now, in your body and your mind. Lord Buddha just got them to look, like with a magnifying glass. Look at your body. If it was you, you'd be able to control it, wouldn't you? Yeah. Well, can you? No. So is it a self? No. And is it pleasant or is it suffering? No, it's suffering. Because they had a 
develop mindfulness and concentration in past lives, when they're listening in that way and they really saw it clearly, the ignorance and the delusions literally exploded out of their mind with the strength of the mindfulness and the concentration. So same with the feelings. Any of these feelings you? Can you control any of them? Can you only have a pleasant feeling? Can you make it last? No. Well, is it a self? No. Is it satisfactory? No, it's unsatisfactory. And then the same with sense consciousness, the different types of consciousness. Is that yours? Can you make it last? No. And coming through all of these things, by the end of that sermon, all five were arahants. So it's wonderful that we know that this is the correct practice, that this is, we basically have the road map, we have the explanations, we know the qualities that we have to cultivate. The reason we don't get enlightened when we recite it or read it or study it is it's a matter of how much one has practiced. So when you understand that the power of delusion, you imagine the Bodhisattva looking back at 500, 1,000, 5,000, 100,000 lives under the Bodhi tree. When you imagine the, the power of the habit of grasping deludedly and being reborn at the moment of death, fear, not wanting to die, wanting to hang on, and then you have to die, but that wanting to hang on goes and gets something else and hangs on. And so it's that we have to train ourselves, which is what we're doing, to weaken the hanging on, and Tanajan Cha, so often says letting go. It's a very large part of practice, Bloi Wang, and you can see why. Because if we don't let go, we hang on. If you hang on, you get rebirth. So we, we have to understand letting go in small ways, letting training ourselves, especially in meditation, to see thoughts as thoughts, feelings as feelings, not to make a self out of them, allow them to cease according to their nature, and just slowly weakening this habit of grasping at things of being a self. But it does require quite a lot of sitting and, and constantly reminding ourselves because sati is called right recollection and in a way when we when when we don't have sati it's like forgetting so the habit is the habit that we have is to keep forgetting and then when we forget we fall into delusion the habits understanding that they're very 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 deep and also understanding that most people around us are doing the same thing so you absorb the habits and you resonate with the habits of those around you, speaking patterns and social patterns, and so you forget. Of course I'm a self, of course my husband's a self, of course my children are selves, and, and uh, all the liking and disliking that, go, that goes with that. So the meditation, the listening to the Dhamma and the chanting, is reminding ourselves a few times a day, hopefully. It's not really a self, you keep dropping that information in. Look at it, have a close look, close your eyes. As soon as the mind's a bit peaceful, there's no big sense of self there. There's no man, there's no woman, there's no husband, there's no children, there's no... You just allow the mind to be peaceful. There's spacious awareness which isn't creating all of this in the mind. But then we come out of the meditation and it all comes back pretty quickly. But the thing we train ourselves is not believing our thoughts. So you can't not have them. But you can not believe them completely. So this is a, a matter of degrees of delusion, isn't it? So it's like being aware of a thought as a thought, knowing the conventions, but then practicing to realize the ultimate truth, which is beyond conventions. So it's like seeing a thought as a thought and having a feeling, not believing it completely, and that gives you choice, doesn't it? Then you can have a choice about whether or not you react or not, whether or not you get angry, whether or not you get greedy. If you have enough mindfulness, you can don't do that. If the greed comes up, the aversion comes up, you can step back from that as well. You don't completely believe your thoughts. And one of the things Ajahn Chah said, he had this wonderful gift for abbreviating things and condensing things to help people to understand. He said, you suffer because of wrong thinking. So this is wrong view. I mean, it's basically thinking that you are and other people are selves. And uh, when you contemplate that enough and you know that there isn't, there really isn't a me and there really isn't others conventionally you can say there is but if you really have a close up there isn't and so whenever we have this suffering it's because of the deluded way that we grasp at our, our bodies and other people's bodies as being me and mine and them so it's a very good teaching always remember whenever you're suffering why are you suffering oh it's because i think i'm a self 
and then uh, go and sit and try to investigate. Where is it? Is the self in the feeling? Which feeling? The physical feeling? The knee pain? Is the self in the knee pain? Is it in the back pain? Or is it in the shoulder pain? Or is the self in that feeling in the heart? The irritation? The hurt feeling? The offended? Is that a self? We have a direct look at it. No, it's just a feeling. But it's when the mindfulness is weak and fuzzy that we can make a solid self out of that. That's delusion. That's something we add to the experience. So we have to keep coming back, sit. The reason I put a lot of emphasis on sitting is because when your eyes are open and you're seeing other people and you've got this deep habit of making themselves, the whole mobile phone thing of modern people as well is they usually don't turn their phone off so someone's always messaging them and they're always messaging someone else and so there's this constant me and them happening with social media is like you're always projecting yourself not always but very often modern people are projecting themselves out into the social network and you need to know how many people like what you did or don't like what you did or and how many people commented and this is a disaster actually for your spiritual practice just to be while we're here if i may take the opportunity just to be really frank about it it's a disaster mm -hmm. you want to come and study teachings on not self you want to realize not self but then we take every opportunity we can to present ourselves and project it out there and see how many people like it and don't like it and comment on it it's a disaster <laughs> if you don't have to do it I, I really recommend that you don't and i really recommend that you just allow yourself spacious moments where you're not conceiving of yourself as a self and making yourself and projecting yourself and your world into the world and Ajahn Anand says this thing about technology Developing the world, loka in Pali, another way that that is translated is darkness. The world, worldly conditions have a dark nature, that's their nature. The more you develop the world, you're developing darkness. So, Dhamma leads inwards, onwards, away from darkness. So the more we're trying to project an idea of a self, a fabricated self into the world the more you're generating and projecting darkness the more you don't do that the more you just allow your mind to be a spacious awareness which isn't creating a self the more your mind will be light and bright so I say it again as I often do be really careful with social media understand that Mara is Geng the power of Mara is Geng Mara is these technologies that uh, very, very smart people are creating. It's not to help you realize the deathless. It's to help you keep updating and uploading and getting a new phone and getting the new app. And it's all rebirth, isn't it? Next year's phone, you're reborn into that phone. Today's Facebook and today's line is like a little rebirth isn't there here I am look at me my life my world my picture my experience do you like it it's all self and it never ends so remember with the Bodhisattva is under the Bodhi tree a hundred lives a thousand lives a hundred thousand lives so I'm, I'm being a little fierce today because it's the last day of your pilgrimage and you'll have to go back to your lives so I'm hoping that you really put some thought into the preciousness of these teachings, the value of them, and understand that it's getting harder and harder to realize them. Because the world is being, in a way, we're being dragged along by this technology. You don't actually have much choice, it seems, because once if something becomes a social norm and a social expectation, the latest research in England from a university showed that your average person in England looks at their smartphone 84 times a day. So some people are doing it much more, some people are doing it less. That's the average. But you ask my opinion, that's kind of madness actually. So the average person is mad. But we get used to it. If that's what's average, if that's what's normal, then we get used to it. This is really scary for the next generation. I'm actually having a new policy in Nandagiri, and next time you go there you'll notice I have, in the future, having a strict 
no photos at all policy. We're making a huge big sign at the very front of the monastery with a big cross through the camera. The monasteries aren't for taking photographs. When people used to come to the monasteries in northeast Thailand just 15 years ago, they never thought to bring a camera. They thought to come and look at your mind. Look inwards. Train yourself in being mindful, not conceive of a self and try to let go of the world and come and come and make offerings to let go of grinding away the sense of self, allowing the mind to become peaceful with the wholesome joy of self-sacrifice. These days, getting your friend to take a photo of you while you offer the food. <laughs> this has become the norm, and it was very fast. So you need to understand, this is Mara. This is Mara, and you need to know Mara. I know you, Mara. Well, when you used to make offerings to let go of yourself, now you make offerings to decorate the self, celebrate the self, project the self. Be very, very careful of this. And I want to help people make merit. I don't want to help people increase their delusion. I don't want to be a part of it either. Hajan, can I take a photo? No. Do you mind if I take a photo? Yes. I really prefer you to be mindful and just be in your body and, and stop doing this. But anyway, so I don't want to, I don't want to become a grumpy abbot either. So that's why the sign at the front of the monastery is just making it clear, no photos. Nice and clear. Come to this monastery because you want to meditate. Close your eyes. Stop being obsessed with visual consciousness. See it as arising, staying for some time, ceasing, not self. So anyway, in the future, just a warning, you'll see that nice big sign. Turn the cameras off. Come and talk to the monks like you used to. Come and make offerings like you used to, without taking photos of it. <laughs> anyway, that's my uh, little spiel. Well, you do have to be careful, don't we? Because this is, it, technology is increasing, it's not decreasing. And uh, people are obsessed, and it is the norm. So if, if you want to train yourself, my point here is if you want to train yourself to have less delusion and less ignorance, so that when you contemplate these things, you have a chance of having insight. Because you need to have the clear, strong mindfulness and the powerful wisdom that isn't making a self and it isn't projecting out into the world. It's leading inwards, putting the world down. It's not interested in bringing in the darkness and spreading darkness. It's interested in putting the darkness down and radiating radiance and luminosity from the mind that sees things as not self. So I'm going to read a little of what the Buddha taught here, translated in English. We already chanted it in Pali. Wandering by stages, the Blessed One came at length to Benares, to the deer park of Isipatana, where the bhikkhus of the group of five were. They saw him coming in the distance. Then they agreed among themselves, friends, here comes the monk Gautama, who became self-indulgent, gave up the struggle, and reverted to luxury. We ought not to pay homage to him, or rise up for him, or receive his bowl or outer robe. Still, a seat can be prepared. Let him sit down if he likes. So remember, he'd taken the milk rice, and those five friends thought, he's lost it, he's lost the plot, he's reverted to luxury. And they went their separate ways. Lord Buddha, of course, had his insight into the middle way, went and sat under the Bodhi tree and became enlightened. As soon as the Blessed One approached, they found themselves unable to keep their pact. One went to meet him and took his bowl and out a robe. Another prepared a seat. Another set out water, footstool and towel. The Blessed One sat down on the seat prepared and washed his feet. They addressed him by name and as friend. When this was said, he told them, Bhikkhus do not address the perfect one by name or as friend. The perfect one is accomplished and fully enlightened. Listen, Bhikkhus, the deathless has been attained, I shall instruct you. I shall teach you the Dhamma by practicing as you are instructed, you will, by realizing it yourselves here and now through direct knowledge, enter upon and abide in that supreme goal of the holy life for the sake of which clansmen rightly go forth from the house life into homelessness. Then the bhikkhus of the group of five said, Friend Gautama, even with the hardship, privation and mortification that you practiced, you achieved no distinction higher than the human state, worthy of the Noble One's knowledge and vision. 
Since you are now self-indulgent and have given up the struggle and reverted to luxury, how will you have achieved any distinction? Then the Blessed One told the bhikkhus of the group of five, the perfect one is not self-indulgent, he has not given up the struggle, he has not reverted to luxury. The perfect one is accomplished and fully enlightened. Listen bhikkhus, the deathless has been attained, I shall instruct you, I shall teach you the Dhamma. By practicing as you are instructed, you will, by realizing it yourselves here and now through direct knowledge, enter upon and abide in that supreme goal of the holy life for the sake of which clansmen rightly go forth from the house life into homelessness. The second time, the bhikkhus of the group of five said the same thing to him, and a second time he gave the same answer. A third time he said the same thing. When this was said, he asked them, bhikkhus, have you ever heard me speak like this before? No, Lord. The perfect one is accomplished and fully enlightened. Listen, bhikkhus, the deathless has been attained. I shall instruct you. I shall teach you the Dhamma. By practicing as you are instructed, you will, by realizing it yourselves here and now through direct knowledge, enter upon and dwell in that supreme goal of the holy life, for the sake of which clansmen rightly go forth from the house life into homelessness. So Lord Buddha knew they had the faculties. They were ready, they were right. And even though they were saying, we don't believe you, uh, we're not sure yet, for a second time, for a third time, if you pay attention and practice as you're instructed, you will realize this yourself, here and now. After the Buddha was enlightened under the Bodhi tree, he was thinking, who could realize this? This is subtle, this is hard to realize. Who would realize this? And he thought of his first two teachers, the ones that taught the seventh and the eighth jhana. And then he realized that they'd already been reborn as Brahma Devas. That was the result of that incredible samadhi. But they were absorbed in their subtle samadhi, and they would be for a very long time. And, and he realized, I can't teach them. They missed the opportunity. But then he realized that this group of five, even though they, in a way, lost faith in him and rejected him, he realized that they would understand. So he walked all this way, especially to teach them. And now they're going to listen to what he has to say. They listened and opened their hearts. Then the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus of the group of five thus. Bhikkhus, there are these two extremes that ought not to be cultivated by one who has gone forth. What two? There is devotion to the pursuit of pleasure in sensual desires, which is low, coarse, vulgar, ignoble and harmful. There is devotion to self-mortification, which is painful, ignoble and harmful. The middle way, discovered by the perfect one, avoids both these extremes. It gives vision, gives knowledge and leads to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana. And what is that middle way? It is this noble eightfold path, that is to say, right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. That is the middle way discovered by the perfect one, which gives vision, gives knowledge, and leads to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, and to Nibbana. There is this noble truth of suffering. Birth is suffering, aging is suffering, Sickness is suffering, death is suffering, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair are suffering. Association with the loathed is suffering and dissociation from the loved is suffering. Not to get what one wants is suffering. In short, the five aggregates affected by clinging are suffering. There is the noble truth of the origin of suffering and it is craving, which produces renewal of being is accompanied by a relish and lust, relishing this and that, in other words, craving for sensual desires, craving for being, and craving for non-being. There is this noble truth of the cessation of suffering, the remainderless fading and ceasing, the giving up, relinquishing, letting go, and rejecting of that craving. There is the noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. It is the noble eightfold path, that is to say, right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. There is this noble truth of suffering. Such was the insight, the knowledge, the understanding, vision, and light that arose in me about things not heard before. This noble truth must be penetrated by fully knowing suffering. Suffering is to be known. Such was the insight, the knowledge, the understanding, etc. 
Lord Buddha then says, this noble truth has been penetrated to, penetrated by me, by fully knowing suffering. So each of these truths has three aspects. The fact of the truth, that it is a noble truth, and then the two more aspects. The one about the suffering is that it has to be fully known, and the third aspect is that it is fully known, with regards to the first noble truth. The second noble truth, origin of suffering, there is this origin of suffering. That's the insight, the knowledge, the understanding. So suffering has a cause. This truth must be penetrated by abandoning the origin of suffering. So abandoning the cause. That was the insight, the knowledge, the understanding, the vision. Lord Buddha then explains this noble truth has been penetrated by him. He has abandoned the origin of suffering. Letting go. The three types of craving. There is this noble truth of the cessation of suffering, that's the insight, the knowledge, the understanding, the vision and light that arose in Lord Buddha. This must be realized. The cessation of suffering is to be realized. And Lord Buddha has realized it. That's the insight, the knowledge, the understanding, the vision and the light. There is this noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. This truth must be penetrated by maintaining it in being, or developing it and then maintaining it consistently. The way leading to the cessation of suffering, such as the insight, etc., Lord Buddha did maintain it in being and brought it to its culmination. Such was the insight, the knowledge, the understanding. As long as my correct knowledge and vision in these twelve aspects in these three phases of penetration to each of the Four Noble Truths was not quite purified, I did not claim to have discovered the full enlightenment that is supreme in the world with its deities, its maras, its divinities, in this generation with its monks and brahmins, with its princes and men. But as soon as my correct knowledge and vision in these twelve aspects, in the three phases, each of the Four Noble Truths was quite purified, then I claim to have discovered the full enlightenment that is supreme in the world, with its deities, its maras, its divinities. The knowledge and vision arose in me, my heart's deliverance is unassailable. This is the last birth. There is no more renewal of being. So remembering that the Bodhisattva had incredibly sharp spiritual faculties, he was able to see that those jhanas degenerated, and he was able to see that patient endurance in pain also wasn't working. But here he had this realization of the deathless. That is known. One knows that. If you realize the deathless, you know you realize the deathless. That was the vision, that was the knowledge. And you know that it's not going to die. Enlightened beings know the mind is liberated. Because they train in understanding what oppresses a mind. They know what oppresses their mind. They know what causes suffering. The suffering is to be known. And then you have to know what is the cause, and then in getting familiar with what is the cause, and then training to let go of that cause. So they know what the cause is, and they're training to let go of it. So when they've let go of it, and they know what the path is, and they're cultivating the path, and so when they maintain that path to its fulfillment, they can see in their own minds the causes of suffering have fallen away. They've been uprooted. That which caused suffering isn't oppressing the mind anymore. And also all of that training, impermanence, 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 arising and ceasing, arising and ceasing, arising and ceasing, then the mind actually experiences something that isn't going to degenerate. And they know that from all of the amazing sati, incredible mindfulness and amazing samadhi, wonderful conditions, but still conditions, conditions that lead to the unconditioned. But when the mind realizes, penetrates the unconditioned, they know this is it. No more birth, no more suffering, no more grasping. Ignorance and delusion and clinging and craving has been uprooted. It's been destroyed. Destroyed by the power of the Dhamma. So Lord Buddha speaking very confidently, I've realized it. I'm the unsurpassed teacher. And if you listen, and if you practice as I teach you, you will realize it too. So, as he was explaining that. Now while this discourse was being delivered, the spotless, immaculate vision of the Dhamma arose in Venerable Kondanya. All that is subject to arising is subject to cessation. And when the will of the Dhamma had been set rolling, 
by the Blessed One. The earth deities cried out, so that's the Chattu Maharaja Devas. In the deer park of Isipatana, the perfect one, accomplished and fully enlightened, set rolling the matchless wheel of Dhamma, it cannot be stopped by monk or Brahman, deity or Mara, divinity or anyone in the world. Now, that's quite a statement for the Devas to be making in Banaras, which is considered at that time to be the holy city of Shiva. This is amazing, this is incredibly revolutionary in this part of India for the Devas to be saying, no, God could stop this. Remember, on one level you've got the Brahmins saying, this is Shiva's city, which will never be destroyed due to the power of Shiva. Lord Buddha is saying, everything is destroyed. Everything is destroyed by the noble truth of impermanence. There's nothing in the conditioned world that's beyond that. And he realized something that was the unconditioned. And so the Devas and the deities are saying, nothing can stop this which is awesome, and thank goodness nothing could stop it. And one of the reasons nothing could stop it, because there are Pacheka Buddhas, remember. Pacheka Buddhas realize they have to cultivate for two Asankhya, two incalculable periods, incredibly long periods, and a hundred thousand eons, and they realize the deathless. But they haven't put in all of the required training and, and efforts to get a large following of students and have the ability to teach. So the reason nothing could stop this wheel of Dhamma was the power of the Buddha's determination in putting all of those conditions in place so that nothing could stop it. So this is an amazing place because this is where the Dhamma jewel was shown to the world. So the Pajeka Buddhas see that Dhamma jewel, they have that Dhamma jewel, but they're not capable of revealing it to others and explaining to them, this is the jewel, look at this jewel, this will liberate you. So we have enormous gratitude to Lord Buddha for putting in the conditions, the people were there ready to listen. Then the people realized what he taught, and then they went and taught people. But that required so many conditions, but all of those conditions are in place. That's why when the Bodhisattva came down from Tushi to heaven, there's that flash of light that fills samsara, because all of that merit and all of those qualities are just there, ready to explode and uh, destroy ignorance in millions of beings' minds. And so this is where it begun. This is where the Dhamma jewel was revealed to the world. This is where the Dhamma wheel was set rolling and nothing could stop it for 5,000 years. <laughs> so at a certain point, it's not that the... I don't think the, the merit of the Buddha is ever exhausted. They have so much merit. But what changes is beings who have the karmic conditions to meet with those teachings. That's finite. At a certain point, people who had the karmic connection with that Buddha, they've all had their connection, they've all done what they can, and then it disappears from the world. But this place is also very special because it's where the Sangha jewel also came into the world, isn't it? So then after this first teaching, you have Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha in the world. After the second teaching, Anattalakkana, then you have five Arahants. And so this is where it happened. This is where the Dhamma jewel and the Sangha jewel the Dhamma Refuge and the Sangha Refuge became, we became aware of these things because of the Buddha's incredible skill and his wisdom capable of teaching. So, that's our good fortune. And the Dhamma wheel is still turning. How quickly it turns, how powerfully it turns in your own mind, it's up to you. So Tanajana Nan often says, when the path factors are in harmony, it's like this wheel rolling in the heart. The Dhamma wheel rolls in your heart, in your mind. That's where the Dhamma wheel has to turn. And in Nibbana, that's something you realize in this fathom long body, isn't it? That's something you realize here also. So all those beautiful prayers to the goddess of the Ganges and prayers to Shiva and prayers to the sun god, that's not going to help you realize your nature. You might get some blessings. You might have some good luck, but you're still subject to death. If you want to realize the deathless, if you want to realize Nibbana, then this Dhamma wheel has to turn in your mind. It has to destroy the ignorance upon which the craving and the delusion is based. It does that with right mindfulness, right concentration, right effort, these Eightfold Path Factors. And the other thing Ajahn Nan says, and this is something we all have to accept humbly, and really pay attention. 
is that when the Dharma wheel isn't turning in your heart, destroying the Kilesa, the Kilesa are destroying the Dhamma. Sorry, it's not that they're destroying the Dhamma, they're destroying the path factors. You can't destroy the Dhamma, the Dhamma is just truth and nature. But Kilesa can destroy your practice of Dhamma. So when you're practicing correctly, the path factors are destroying the kilesas, greed, hatred, and delusion. When you get a bit lazy and start to go backwards, then we need to understand the kilesas are destroying the path factors. They're kind of literally throwing the dhamma wheel out of the heart, out of the mind. Then you have to put it back in. It's a bit of a holy war, <laughs> in a way. Anyway, we have the instructions, we have the teachings, we have the teachers, and then at the end of this three weeks, really good to set the determined intention to take care of your mindfulness and and be really careful in setting boundaries. The Buddha, see the first few thousand monks, they didn't need rules because they knew what was appropriate. They didn't need the Buddha to lay down the Padimokha. After a few years and the numbers increased and the Buddha needed to start to put boundaries. So Buddha teaches Dhamma and Vinaya. Vinaya, discipline, that's something we need to work out. What's the container, what's the boundary, what's enough, what's too much? And then Ajahn Chah, he said, actually you need to, you need to understand that the power of the Kilesa and the craving is a little bit more than we think, or quite a lot more than we think. So you actually have to aim upstream, understanding that you're going to be washed downstream. <laughs> So, you know, it's like a, a river that's flowing very fast, this craving. So, whenever you set your standards, you probably try to do a bit more, understanding that life will throw challenges at you and your, your practice will get challenged. So, when things are good, do as much practice as you possibly can. And, but now's a good time just to set that determination and that resolution. So, the Dharma, another phrase Lord Buddha used, the gates to the deathless are open, let those with faith demonstrate that. So whether or not we walk through the gates of the deathless is dependent on whether or not we lay the conditions and that phrase Lord Buddha is using, maintain in being. So that means consistent, that means being consistent. And then setting those boundaries, what affects your mindfulness, what causes you to have more craving, more aversion, whatever makes your mindfulness fuzzy and causes you to have more craving and more aversion. So you need to set serious boundaries with it. And what is it that eats into your meditation time? Have a really close look. If it is Facebook, uh, stop doing it. If it, you know, it makes you spin out into samsara too much and think too much about what all these other people are doing. And I've said this many times and I'll keep saying it, part of the karma of this lifetime, don't turn your phone on in the morning until you've done your meditation. Just give yourself some time before having to be someone for people and having to be their audience and having them to be your audience. Just don't have to be a celebrity. Let celebrities have the suffering of celebrities. You can be nobody and, and enjoy that. Spare time is an incredible blessing. And being able to be nobody is actually much nicer than being somebody if you allow yourself that subtle happiness <laughs> so I offer this as my last reflection I do rejoice in your sincere efforts people have practiced very hard I often ask people what time should we get up and most of the time you opted for the earlier option so people have practiced hard and people have been restrained with taking photos and with shopping so I do think that uh, we've all put in a very good effort and I rejoice in that, and I hope that the merit of this pilgrimage for you is a source of power. That you have now more power to be resolved and determined and consistent in the way that you can be, so that you might uproot the causes of suffering and realize the complete cessation of suffering.
Yeah, that's all. 